Well, tonight is going to be the last night on relationships, and as you can see, it's all about how to end one. Here are the questions that I get, and probably many of you have had. I'm married, number one, and how do I know if I should get a divorce or not? Number two, I'm dating. Are there any guidelines that would help me know if I should end the relationship? Because I'm not convinced the guy's a jerk, but he's starting to look like one, so help me with that. And number three, I'm in a relationship that's been going for a long time as we've gone through addiction together, cheating together, all of that kind of stuff, even some abuse. Can it be repaired? Or do I just say, no, see you later? Or in a relationship, in a friendship type of relationship. So I'm getting to know this person and I've let them into my life. And now I'm kind of second guessing myself that maybe I shouldn't have let them in so far. Now what do I do? Do I ghost them and walk away? Do I try to push boundaries out a little bit and make it more of a casual friendship? How do you do that and what's the best way to go about that? I get asked that a lot. Bottom line is the issue is this. In a relationship, should I fight for it or end it? And that happens in all kinds of scenarios from intimate romantic relationships to friendships, etc. So that's what I want to look at. Now to kind of set the stage... In your mind, I just want you to think about how you've responded to relationship problems in the past. So some of you are excellent at one strike, you're out. You hurt me, I ghost you, no second chances, not going to work at it, not going to try to repair it, it's done. And that's how you've gone through adult life. Others of you give way too many chances. You let them hurt you, abuse you, cheat on you, and you keep taking them back. So that's kind of one of two extremes. A third scenario, and I get this one all the time. Do you realize that people love to complain to me about their friend or their partner, but not do anything about it? So they complain about what a jerk they are, and I go, well, what are you going to do? Are you going to set a boundary? Oh, no, I just want to complain about it. And so that's a very normal thing. Or they say, I'm going to set a consequence at a boundary with this person. So they announce a boundary and then never enforce it. That's very common as well. Or they set a boundary, enforce it for a little while, and then things start improving and they let the boundary disappear. And it goes back to the way it used to be. And that's a very normal thing. Or... I don't like what you're doing. I'm really mad at you, but I'm not going to get rid of you. I'll just nag you, manipulate you, try to control you, because I'm going to change you. So there's a lot of that that happens. Or, and the sad thing for most of those options are, you get so preoccupied with the flaws and the failures of the other person, you forget about yourself. And before you know it, you're in a really bad place because you haven't been working on yourself, you've been working on them. And so those are the scenarios that many people, most people in recovery have done in their relationships. And I want you to think about a different way tonight. So let me give you the criteria that I would present to a person. So big picture, and we've talked about this, A relationship can only get healthy and only grow if both people are working on themselves. Both people have to be willing to own their stuff and change. If only one person is working and the other refuses to, that relationship will not work or be healthy no matter how hard you try to work. So that's just reality. So, future of any relationship, when people come to see me, I'm not just looking at, are you willing to own your stuff and change? 
I'm also trying to get a sense of, is the other person willing to own their stuff and change? And what happens for a lot of people who are addicts is this. You're in a relationship, you're an addict, it's obviously you're the messed up one. And so you work on yourself, but the other person thinks, I don't need to change, they're the one that needs help. And then issues start coming in the relationship, but they're still not willing to change. They still want to make it, you're the sick one. And so they twist everything to say you're the problem. And people hear that and think, maybe I am because I am an addict, blah, blah, blah. And they stay in the relationship way too long. So that is a very common thing. So number one thing you got to do. You need to know where to draw a line in the sand that says if you cross this line, we're done. And that line can't just be that you don't dye your hair a certain color. That's, that's a dumb line. It's got to be a line that's related to character. So if you keep lying to me, we're done. If you don't start growing up and accepting responsibility for things around here, we're done. If you don't learn to deal with your anger and quit lashing out the way you do, we're done. If you don't stop all your jealousy and manipulation and control, we're done. So those are the kind of things you have to decide what is worth ending a relationship for. What is a non-negotiable deal breaker? That you need to be clear in your mind. If the person you're with is doing that thing, part two then, is you talk to them. And say, when you do this, it's keeping me from trusting you, from having a healthy relationship. It is not loving. So this has to change, or here's the consequence. So what will typically happen is they'll want to change, and they might change for a little bit, and then slide back. So then you have to begin to get straight in your mind. Okay, change is kind of messy, so they might do well, slide back, do well, but they really want to change, so they'll keep working at it, or they might be a con man who changes for a little while and then goes back. So that means, number three, you got to leave long enough period of time to do the evaluation of whether they're really going to change. So it might be, in your mind, I'm going to give this person three months, six months. I've stated the boundary. I've stated the consequence. Now I will watch. And then if they still don't change, then you enforce the consequence. So that, in my mind, is kind of what you have to have clear in your mind so that you don't end up staying in this too long. And here's why I say that. The longer you stay in a sick relationship with a sick person who isn't willing to own their stuff, the sicker you become. It wears you down. It takes its toll on you. So this isn't just about getting rid of a jerk. This is about protecting yourself and keeping yourself growing. Okay? Number three. Some people will say, but I love them. What I have learned over the years is there's a lot of definitions of love that are really bad misunderstandings of love. So people think the loving thing to do is this, but that's really not a very loving thing to do. So I want to give you five common misconceptions that people have that caused them to stay in relationships when it should have been ended a long time ago. Number one, love means you make sacrifices for people. You put your needs aside at times in order to meet their needs. And you serve other people. That is a wonderful definition of love. But in an intimate relationship or a friendship... Both have to be living by that definition. If you're the only one making sacrifices and serving, and the other's not doing any of that, that is not love to continue in that. Because what you're doing is enabling them to stay immature and irresponsible and selfish, 
and you're giving up all your needs and doing all the sacrificing, that will eventually make you sick. Second, while love means humility, it means submitting yourself to another person and their needs. And what many people don't realize, that definition contains love means becoming a doormat. Love means letting people walk all over you. Love means tolerating wrong, unloving, abusive behavior. Love means not standing up for yourself. Do you want to know what true humility is? I don't think I'm better than anybody, but I'm not less than anybody either. So I will stand up for myself if somebody wants to make me less than. So love is not being a doormat. Humility and love is I stand up for me just as much as I stand up for you. Third one. Many people have an idea that love is always syrupy, sweet, kind. Just be nice to people. All of that stuff. You never get angry. You never get harsh. That is very unloving in their mind. I don't know if you've been a parent for very long, but if you're sweet to your kids constantly and you never have to be harsh or say no, then you're not probably a very good parent because we all need a tough side to love. If we don't have a tough side, we will just keep pushing the boundary to see what we can get away with. And if you're still sweet and nice to us and cleaning up after us, We will begin using you and abusing you as long as you'll put up with it. So love has to have a tough side and a gentle soft side in order to be a whole package love. Number four. Many people think love means you never set boundaries. So I remember early in marriage, once in a while people would show up at our door. And just want to come in. And I just had a busy day. And I said, sorry, I, I, I can't, you can't come in. And my wife would go, oh, you're being so rude and unkind. I go, if I let everybody in, I'll burn myself out. So love sets boundaries. Love says, this is okay. Outside of here is not. And if you go outside of here, there will be consequences. So I will not tolerate lying. So to be a loving parent, you say to your child, if we're going to have a healthy relationship, there's going to be no lying. So if you lie, there will be consequences. And so love is fighting for boundaries that reinforce love and keep it healthy. It has to have boundaries. What happens for a lot of people is that they set boundaries in recovery and people break those boundaries and then they don't enforce the consequences. So it's important to understand it's number one, necessary to set boundaries, but number two, it's just as important to enforce the boundary. And that is where many people struggle because to enforce the boundary means I enforce a consequence for breaking the boundary. And that leads many people to say, oh, I couldn't do that. That would be too hard. I might hurt their feelings. And and I just couldn't do that. And I go, so what you're saying is you're going to let people walk all over you, use you and abuse you, and you're never going to stand up for yourself and what is loving. So that is important. And then the fifth misconception is forgiveness. And what people think is if I forgive somebody who's hurt me badly, that automatically I just start trusting them again, or I let them totally back into my life, and I don't set any boundaries with them, and I always give them more chances. That is not forgiveness. Forgiveness, if a person's hurt me badly, what forgiveness means is I'm not going to take revenge into my own hand. But that doesn't mean I'm not going to set a boundary with you and not let you into my life again until I have ample evidence that you've changed. Then then I'll let you in. So forgiveness doesn't mean let everybody walk back all over you 
and act like nothing happened in the first place. So those are common misconceptions. So let me go to some facts about damaged relationships that I've seen over the last 15 years in my field as a counselor with people in addiction and from trauma. So number one, a very common scenario for people in addiction is they cheat on each other. And so I get couples all the time coming to ask me, my partner cheated on me, I cheated on them, can we make it work again? And what I basically say is this, how long do you think it would take for you to trust them again? If they are really working on themselves, how long do you think before you would be able to confidently trust them again? And they stop and they, you can tell the wheels are turning. And I'll go make it simple for you. Two to five years. Maybe more realistically for some, ten years. Because I say, what will happen if in two years... They phone from work and say, I'm going to be a bit late from work tonight. i got to stop at Walmart. Where does your brain go? They're not going to Walmart. they got somebody on the side. And I go, that's after two or three years your mind goes there. So you have to ask yourself, are you convinced both of you are committed to work on your stuff? Secondly, are you willing to, <clears throat> to wait two to five years? of working, working, working at a relationship with no guarantee it's going to work out, that's the issue you have to decide. Second scenario. I have had many occasions where there's two people in recovery that are both working on their stuff. And they're growing a lot. And then they get in a relationship and once in a relationship, there's all their old stuff is triggered. And now there's conflict and fight and hurt feelings and all of that. And they come and see me. And I'll meet with them and I'll try to process stuff and help them work it out. But sometimes I come to this conclusion. Both of you want to work on your stuff and I'm convinced both of you are. You just don't have the tools yet to work on the tough parts of intimate relationships. So you can stay together, <clears throat> but if you don't have the tools, you're going to continue to create more baggage and do more damage. So it's not that you don't want it to work. It's not that you're not wanting to change and have a healthy relationship. It's just that where you're both at right now in your growth, you're incapable of that. And that's not a judgment on you that ca should cause you shame. It's just the reality of where you are in your own journey. And so, I say separate, work on your stuff. Maybe you're going to revisit it down the road. But if you stay together, you're only going to make things worse. Next one. <clears throat> what many people do in recovery is they lose sight of the big picture. And it goes like this. If you come from complex trauma, there's a good chance the person you end up with will also have some complex trauma. So, for this relationship now to work, you got a couple things. you got to be working on your stuff. That's a lot of work. they got to work on their stuff. Then you're going to have issues between you that you got to work on and resolve. But then you got your baggage from the past that can get triggered by the relationship that's going to cause you to work on a lot of painful stuff from the past. So for a relationship to work, for two people from complex trauma, you got a ton of things to be working on. you got a ton of issues that can get triggered. And you need to be aware of that. Next thing. Let's say you were in a relationship and you did draw a line in the sand and you ended it. Then the other person came to you and they said, I'm so sorry. And it looks like they're working on themselves and, and it'll be different this time. Lots of promises. They are going to meetings, etc. So you let them back in. And then they mess up again. 
and you kick them out again. And then a few months later, they come back begging and convinced that they're changed and everything's going to be different this time, and you let them back in. And that happens a few times. Now, let's say they really have changed the tenth time. But you let them in, are you convinced they've changed? You're going, huh, this could be like the other times. And what is happening with them from the past is, I just got to manipulate this partner of mine and they'll let me back. So if you let them back, even though they're really wanting to change, you're letting them think again that maybe their manipulation worked. And so what I have seen happen is if somebody's manipulated their way back a number of times, the chances of that relationship ever working are very small. Because you'll never be convinced they've truly changed and they will still think their manipulation will work. And so I say often to people, you just have to separate. Because you'll never be able to sort it out if you get back together. So those are hard realities. So that leads to the next question. How do I know if the person is really changing. And here's the scenario it comes from. And most of you have gone through this. I call it crisis management. You're in a relationship, you have a big fight, you boot them out. Crisis takes place. They say, I'll do whatever you want. Just take me back. So you take them back. And guess what? <clears throat> they are the most polite, considerate, sweet, sacrificing person until the crisis is passed. And then they slide back into old behaviors. And so we all know from experience that people can change in order to get you to change the consequence, but it's not genuine change. It is change in a crisis to manipulate you to let them away with it. So we have to develop criteria that takes that into consideration. Because many people have been fooled by that over and over again. Here's what I tell people. The only way I would be convinced that somebody who's been abusive to me or has cheated on me has really changed is they cannot be in my life. They got to want to change for themselves with no hope of ever having a relationship with me. Because if they're changing in order to get a relationship with me, I can't trust that change. Because they're possibly just changing for all the wrong reasons, and it's not genuine. So the only way to be convinced is they got to be separate from me, and they got to be committed to change on their own for themselves. That is really the only criteria that will enable you to get a really accurate picture of whether the change is real. And that's very, very hard to do. Now let's say you want to do that. Be ready for the comebacks that they are now going to have to try and get you to take them back. <clears throat> so the first one, Need, yeah. Only you understand me. I need you to help me because none of these other jerks out there know me well enough to help me. And they'll give you that sob story and make you feel like you're the greatest psychologist and counselor in the world and the only one that will work for them. And you can get sucked into that. Or they can go to, if you end this and kick me out, I'll kill myself. And then you go, oh, I couldn't do that. I wouldn't want that in my conscience. They just manipulated you. And you can't control what they do that way. But if you let them back in, you're teaching them all they have to do to get their way is to threaten to kill themselves. And you'll fold. And that is a da dangerous precedence. Or they might threat you physically. If you get rid of me, you'll be sorry. I will make your life hell. I will do all kinds of things to hurt you. And the fear 
causes you to take them back and give them another chance. So you have to be prepared for that. And then some, they will start texting you a billion times a day, sending you flowers, sending you poems they've written about their love for you, showing up at your work with roses, all of those things, trying to wear you down, trying to get you to give them an opportunity. Now let me give you this, and I've sadly seen it happen over and over again. Many people from complex trauma are attracted to narcissists. And narcissist is, I'm the most wonderful thing in the world. <clears throat> you adore me, and you are lucky to have me, and I own you. So, you break up, well now you're making them look bad. And they can never be made to look bad. So they will manipulate, manipulate to let you back in. Let's say you let them in. <clears throat> you train them that manipulation gets you to change the boundary. They mess up again, you kick them out, and they manipulate their way back. What you taught them was this. Your no doesn't mean no. It means try harder. So now you really are determined to get rid of them. Well, you've trained them for years to keep manipulating. So you have to be ready for a long battle of sticking to your guns. Don't open the door a crack. It has to remain sealed shut before they get the message that there's no future here. And that is hard to do. So let me just end with some of the tough parts in ending a relationship. If you have kids together, there's always the concern about the kids. Let me say this. For you to stay together, you hurt the kids. For you to split up, you hurt the kids. There's no win-lose option. They're both bad options. What you're trying to decide is what's the best of the bad options. And usually... It's the splitting up. Staying together, kids pick up stuff that's never said, stuff that hurts them and messes them up, and I deal with it all the time. So don't let the kids be your only reason for staying if the relationship is really unhealthy. Second, Many people, when they break up, will say, can we still be friends? And I just smile when they tell me that. Because what they mean is, could we still go out for coffee once a week as friends? And for many of them, what that means is, can we go out once a week and we're back on? Then I'll be twice a week, then I'll be texting every day, and then it's serious again. So some people, not many, some people are able to say, it's done, I'll let you be friends, here's the boundaries. Some are able to keep it there, but not many. And so for many people, it's done and not even friends, because they're not strong enough to handle coffee once a week. It will suck them back in because the emotions will all start up again. And before you know it, it's back on. Third thing is, what I find in dealing with people is they want to end the relationship, but really they're afraid to end it. So the reason they don't end it is fear. All kinds of fears. Number one, fear of being judged. If you get a divorce, oh, what will all the people think? So there's that fear. Many are afraid of being alone. They can't stand being alone, but many are afraid that this is another failure in my relationship life. I may never get a relationship that's healthy, That's scary. 
And so there's a fear of never ending up in a healthy relationship. And then many people say, I can't break up because I'll hurt their feelings. So their concern is hurting the feelings of the other person. So what I say to them, you would rather hurt yourself than to hurt their feelings. That is out of balance. Yeah, you might hurt their feelings. They'll get over it. But if you stay, you hurt yourself for months and years. So you have to become convinced that you're valuable enough to protect. That you're valuable enough to take care of. And that will involve hurting people's feelings at times. But that's okay. That's life. That's what you got to do sometimes. But you're worth it to do that. So that is the ending of relationships. What I find interesting, if you were to follow my life as a counselor, is probably 75% of the time when couples come to see me, I say, I don't see any hope here. Probably be a good idea to just talk about ending it. Now, it's, it's bad when a counselor, 75% of his advice say it's post. <clears throat> Get over it. There's very few times when I say, yeah, keep working. Because usually so much damage has been done that it's irreparable. And what I say to people is this. You scrambled an egg. It's really hard to unscramble an egg. And that's what you're dealing with. And so part of my job is just to help people see the reality of it, to validate some of their perceptions and feelings, and then leave the choice with them. Some do end it, most say, I'm going to keep trying. And then they come and see me a year later, and things are even worse. So you're going to have to make those hard decisions, All I've wanted to do tonight is lay out some of the things that are very important to think through, process, and I hope you'll make good decisions. So we've been doing with this relationship piece in the Christian section, the relationship with God. And we've been looking at kind of the difficulties that people from complex trauma have when it comes to developing a relationship with God. So first it's, I don't think God would want a relationship with me. I've screwed up too bad. How could he love me? And then I don't know if I can trust God because I've always seen him as kind of an angry, mean God. So we've been talking about that. Tonight I want to talk about one of the most difficult parts of this trusting God because we've said that the relationship with God is really... A relationship where you just grow in your trust of Him, His promises, and all of that. So the scenario is like this. If God is a loving God, and He was watching me getting sexually abused, and I prayed and begged for Him to stop it, why didn't He stop it? How can I trust a God who didn't answer my prayer from a very painful place as a child. And I want to say up front that that is a very difficult question to answer. I don't know if we can ever totally answer it. I'm going to try to give you pieces to the answer tonight that I hope will help you. But I want you to understand that I don't pretend to say I have the whole answer for that. But there's two things that I that are important to factor into your thinking. And that's what we're going to talk about tonight. Number one, though God is God, when He created this world, He did not create us to be robots that just loved Him or did nice things to each other. He created with us a free will. Now, in order to have a free will... Where I can choose to love, I also have to have the option of choosing to be unloving. Otherwise, free will means nothing if I only have one option. So, 
God created us with the ability to love or to hurt. Now when God set up the world, he basically made an agreement with himself that he would not interfere. If people want to be nice, fantastic. If people are going to hurt each other, I will not interfere. So he is not a God that comes and stops every person who's about to do something wrong and say, I'm going to take away your free will for a while and I'm going to make you a robot again because you can't hurt. He says, no, to give free will, I have to accept the ramifications of people having free will and not interfere. So what we find out early in the Bible is that as soon as people kind of turned their back on God, they started hurting each other. And then generations after generations of hurting each other, and God did not interfere. But what he did was, he said two things. Number one, hopefully the pain that they cause will cause people to say, this is no way to live. I need God. I want to come back to live by God's design so that the pain and heartache would be a motivation of driving people back to God. And many of you have sat in detox or at a bottom and for the first time in years in your life you've reached out to God and said, please help me. So it turned you back to God. Second thing, God says when a person turns back to me and surrenders their life to me, Romans 8.28 gives us this beautiful promise God causes all things to work together for our good. For those who love Him, those who have surrendered to Him. Notice it doesn't say God just takes the good things we do and turns them for good. He says all things. The bad crap that happened to you, the bad decisions you've made. God says if you surrender to me, I will take all of those negatives and turn them into a positive. And that is His promise. And I can honestly say I've seen him do that in my own life. And I've seen him do it in thousands of life. Do you realize in my own life, the things that have caused me the greatest pain and heartache are now the things that I have that make me a good teacher to addicts. Because I learned from them and God turned them into a good. So that's the story I want to tell you about. So... Last week we talked about Jacob, the master manipulator. And remember, he wanted to marry his cousin Rachel, who was drop-dead gorgeous, and he ended up getting Leah, whose name means cow. Okay? So, they didn't get along together, and he favored Rachel over Leah. But Rachel couldn't have kids. She was barren. So she says, no problem. I will go and get my servant girl... And she'll sleep with Jacob. And the rules at that time was any child she has would be Rachel's child. So they do that. So now Rachel's got three women he's sleeping with. If you're following that. And then Leah, who is like a rabbit and popping them out, all of a sudden couldn't have babies. So she said, I'm going to get my servant girl to sleep with Jacob. So now he's got four. So there are 13 kids, four moms. Now, Joseph was the firstborn son of Rachel. So she eventually was able to conceive, and she had Joseph. So, favorite wife, has a child. Guess how Joseph is treated by Jacob? Spoiled rotten. Favored child. So what we are told he does is he gives Joseph a coat. Now, if you went to Sunday school, you heard the story of the coat of many colors. And in your mind, you're going, oh, there was a red line, an orange line, and a blue line, and a green line. It was many colors. That's not what it means. What it means was it was a coat that said two things. Number one, it said you don't have to work. So it was a coat where the sleeves went right down to the wrists. So in that culture, when you worked, you pushed your sleeves up so your arms were free, But if you got a coat like that, you didn't have to work. So he was spoiled in the fact that everybody else had to go to work. He didn't. And then it meant you're going to get the inheritance. So all the older brothers, and he had ten older brothers, they're not getting the inheritance you are. 
So can you imagine how the ten older brothers felt about little Joseph? And then to make things worse, Joseph has this dream. And he comes out and he wants to announce it at breakfast to all his brothers and his dad. And he says, I had a dream and I became the most important person in the world and you bow down to me. Now they're going, this has gone to his head. This guy's got an ego problem. He's got a head the size of a barn. He is out of control. Instead of Joseph seeing their reaction, he has a second dream. And he announces it at breakfast and says, same dream, just a little different, but I'm still the greatest person and you're all bowing down to me. So what happens, we're told, is that those brothers hated him. And in the Bible it says they hated him. And then it repeats it, how much they hated him. They hated him with great hatred. All of those things, so you get the idea. They couldn't stand him. And so they became very abusive to him. They verbally abused him always putting him down. And so he lived in a family where there's favoritism, it was very dysfunctional, and now there's all kinds of bullying and abuse happening. So what happens one day, the older brothers, they were shepherds, have taken all the sheep quite a ways away from home because that's where the pasture was. And they've been away for a while. And so dad's Jacob says to Joseph, please go check that your brothers are okay. So Joseph goes off to check on his brothers, and they see him coming with his fancy coat. And they go, here is our chance to get rid of this jerk. And so they basically decide they're going to kill him. And then one of the brothers says, no, I couldn't do that. Let's sell him. So there was a band of traders. So they were right on the, the major trade route in the whole world. So all Eastern people that were going to Egypt, which was the world power, traveled right by where they had their sheep. So they see a bunch of traders coming and they offer to sell Joseph to them. And they buy Joseph. So he is taken down to Egypt and sold as a slave. Now that's a tragedy. You are taken and he would be stripped naked. He would be put on an auction block. He wouldn't understand the language. People would be poking at him because his skin color was different. And he would be abused. And then he was purchased as a slave. And that meant he was at the lowest rung of the ladder. Can you imagine that little guy? He's still in the teens. Saying, God, where are you? You gave me a dream I was going to be the greatest person in the world. This isn't what's happening here. He was missing dad. He felt abandoned. Total rejection. He felt totally lost and confused in a foreign culture. He felt great pain because of his new slave status and the abuse he was receiving. A major tragedy. Doesn't end there. He is purchased by a guy by the name of Potiphar. And what we're told about him is that he was Pharaoh's bodyguard, the head of the bodyguards. And what that means is he was deeply trusted by Pharaoh. He was very close to Pharaoh, who's the king of the world. And Pharaoh says, I will put you in charge of my safety. So he is a really, really high up guy. So he buys Joseph. Joseph is a slave, but Potiphar begins to notice that Joseph is smart, and he's really good and organized, and he's got a really good attitude. He's not like a bitter, angry slave that he's used to having. So he says, I'm going to make him responsible for more things in the house. And over time, he puts Joseph in charge of everything, all his money, all his possessions. He trusts Joseph that much. Problem. He's got a wife who's horny. <laughs> Potiphar's away a lot. Joseph is a young, good-looking buck. So she starts saying, hey, Joseph, I'd really like to go to bed with you. Now think of you, Joseph. Some of you are saying, okay, go ahead, let's go. Joseph said, no, I will not hurt my master by cheating with you. 
She keeps it up. Now, Joseph could have said, well, she's the boss. I guess I better do what I'm told. He keeps saying no, keeps saying no. He says, I can't do that to my master, and I can't do that to my God. And you go, whoa, he still believes in the God that let him become a slave? This guy's trusting this God, even though he's a slave? That's amazing. So one day, Potiphar's wife says, Joseph, come to bed with me. And that morning she made sure nobody else was in the house. She got rid of all the other slaves. And she grabs him to force him to go to bed. And he runs. So he lets go of his coat. She's grabbing his coat. And he wiggles out and takes off. Potiphar comes home that night and guess who's standing there with the coat? His wife saying, Joseph tried to rape me and I grabbed his coat. No trial. Joseph is put in prison. But it's not just a prison. It's a dungeon. It's a dungeon where people went who were the worst criminals. It was dirty, wet, rot infested. That's where Joseph went. Well, so much for my dream of being the greatest person in the world. Here I am again. I just started getting my hopes up again. I was getting responsibilities and respect and now I am falsely accused, terrible injustice has been done, and I am stuck in jail until I die. There will be no trial. Can you imagine the confusion and the pain and the hurt he would have had? Well, the jail keeper, the boss, notices this prisoner that's not like other prisoners. He's polite. He works hard. He does his chores. He's not angry. So he starts giving him responsibilities around the jail and he does a beautiful job. And he says, you know what? I'm going to put him in charge of the care of some of the most important prisoners. So Joseph gets elevated again in a jail. And then one day, two people land up in jail. And they are Pharaoh's baker and cupbearer. So there were three people in Pharaoh's life who were the closest to him that he trusted his whole life to. His bodyguard, Potiphar, his baker and cupbearer, they tested the food the baker did before Pharaoh ate it, and the cupbearer drank every liquid before Pharaoh drank it. So if a person wanted to poison him, cupbearer would drop over dead, Pharaoh would stay alive. Baker would drop over dead, Pharaoh would stay alive. So somebody has tried to poison Pharaoh, and he's gotten very sick. And Pharaoh says, well, it's either the baker or the cupbearer. That's the only way poison could get through. So both of them are going to jail. So Joseph has them. And he builds a relationship with them, treats them with respect, gets to know them. One morning he comes to them, and they're both sad and troubled. And he says, what's the matter? And they said, we both had a dream. And we don't know what it means. Now, if I was Joseph, I'd say, don't believe dreams. You want to know what he says? God gives dreams. And God can give me the, the meaning of your dreams. Tell me your dreams. So he listened to the dreams. So he's still trusting God somehow. He listens to the dream. And he says to the baker, your dream means you're going to die. You're guilty. Cupbearer, you're innocent. You're going to get restored. Happens just as it happens. Just as Joseph said. So as the cupbearer is going off to be restored, Joseph takes him aside and he says, Joseph, he says, you've got to know me. I'm in jail. I didn't do anything wrong. It's unjust. Please put in a good word to Pharaoh for me. And the cupbearer says, sure thing, I promise. I'll talk to Pharaoh and you'll be out of jail. Promptly forgets all about it. So you can imagine Joseph the next morning waiting at his cell door. They're going to let me out today. Maybe I'll shave and comb my hair. Nobody shows up. The next day, the next day, nothing, nothing. Two years pass. Nothing. And you go, where's God in all of this? Well then, amazing thing happens. Pharaoh, it's his birthday. And he has a dream. The night of his birthday. And he talks to all of his wise men, and they can't tell what his dream means. And his cupbearer goes, Bingo! 
I remember a guy that interprets dreams. He's in jail. Oh, did I ever blow that one? I forgot. And they rush and they get Joseph and they says to Pharaoh, the mightiest man in the world, tell me your dream. And he tells Joseph his dream. He says, here's what your dream means. There's going to be seven years of plenty. Uh, bumper crops for seven years, seven years of famine. He says, here's what I do if you don't mind me giving my opinion, Mr. Pharaoh. During the seven years of plenty, tax the people 20% of the grain and fill up silos with grain so that when the famine hits, there's enough food to feed everybody. And Pharaoh says, what a wonderful idea. You know what? I'm putting you in charge of the whole land. You're the boss. I will be higher than you in title, but you're going to be the king of the world. Wow, there's a dream. Now, why did that happen? To really appreciate it, you've got to understand there's another perspective happening here. So way back, God said when he brought Israel into Israel as it is today, he said there's still nations all around Israel that are so screwed up that it would like taking a little kid and putting him in prison and say, raise my kid. It would destroy them. So my little wee nation, I got to take and put him kind of in a bubble for a while so they can grow and get strong. So I got to take them out of their promised land and put them in a safe bubble for 400 years so they can grow as a nation. Now, how am I going to get people to go from their nice little new land that they love and are not going to leave? How am I going to get them to leave it? I'm going to send a famine. Okay, if there's a famine, where would they go for food? Well, Egypt has the Nile River and it's the breadbasket of the world. So they'll go to Egypt to get food. Okay, that's great so far, but there's a problem. Egyptians hate people from Israel. So the only way they're going to let them come to Egypt to eat is if somebody who loves Jews is in Egypt in the government. Well, how am I going to get somebody who loves Israel into the government? And for them to get into the government, they got to rub shoulders with influential people. They got to get to know how the government runs. They got to get training on being a good administrator. How am I going to do that? Well, I'll have some brothers hate their brother. I'm not interfering. I'm just letting people do their thing. They're going to sell him. He's going to be a slave. He's going to get training with Potiphar, rub shoulders with a high and mighty. He's going to go to prison. He's going to get training there and rub shoulders with the three closest people to Pharaoh. Pharaoh's going to have a dream. Well, isn't that interesting? So what happened was this. The famine hit. Guess who shows up one day, wanting grain? His ten older brothers. Now, if that was me, I'd say, you're all dead. Because you screwed me over. But here's what he says. It says, his brothers came and bowed before him, just like his dream said they would do. And they thought they would never do. But they came and threw themselves on the ground before him. And here's what he says. You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good. To accomplish what is now being done, the saving of the world. So he says, yeah, you guys did wrong. You guys hurt me greatly. But I have a God that took all of that crap and worked it into a plan so that good came out of it, which is the salvation of many lives. And you want to know? That's the promise God makes to you. Crap happens. You're going to get hurt. And you're going to wonder where God is. And God says, hang in there and trust. And you will find that I will take that crap. And I will turn it into good. And use you to help others. 